Welcome to the first part of chapter 2, which will be on classical polarization. We need to talk about classical polarization before we can start talking about quantum polarization, so this lesson and the next will just be going over classical polarization. First off, you have an electromagnetic wave, which this is the electromagnetic wave. It's propagating in the x direction with the magnetic field in the zx plane and the magnetic field in the yx plane. The wave vector is defined as k vector equals k in the x hat direction, which is the direction of propagation, where the wave number just is the ratio 2 pi over the wavelength, which can be reduced to angular frequency over the speed of light. The electric field can therefore be represented as components in the y direction and components in the z direction. This picture only shows them in the y direction, but in general you can have an electric field that has electric field components in both directions, if it's propagating in the x direction that is. Because if it's propagating in the z direction, then it would have components in the x and y direction. But in this example, it's propagating in the x direction. The components can further be written in the cosine form because they are waves, of course, they oscillate, and you have the wave number times its position minus omega t. And of course, you can have a phase shift for the second com secondary component, which is encoded with this angle phi. In general, however, cosine is just a subcategory of e, I, e to the i theta, and so it's just the real part of this complex expression and so it's much easier in general to write electric fields as being comprised of the magnitude in a direction and the wave being represented with Euler's number raised to the power. And if you take an e &M class, you'll actually see that the imaginary part does have physical significance relating to skin depth, which is the amount of dissipation that occurs when a wave enters a medium. The amplitude of the electric field overall is just defined using the Pythagorean theorem. And using this, you can pull out the magnitude and the wave equation from both of the direction vectors. And you'll notice then that we have a scalar component out here and a vector component right here. That is what we call the polarization vector. And in fact, it is a unit vector for the magnitude of this is one. But the direction here is the direction in which the electric field is polarized hence why it's called the polarization vector. It gives the direction of the electric field, which is trans, a transverse wave, meaning that it, uh, it exists perpendicular to the direction of propagation. The intensity can be defined as the square of the magnitude of the electric field. In many textbooks, including Griffith's electrodynamics textbook, the intensity is actually defined as the average intensity, which is given power per area. But in this book, we'll just be covering intensity as the magnitude of the electric field squared. In the simplest case, we have linear polarization, where the polarization does not change. It just oscillates along a line. And that's just called linear polarization, where you have a phase shift of zero between the components. And this creates a line with an angle theta with respect to the y-axis when it is propagating in the x direction. Circular polarization arises when you have a phase shift of pi over 2, and you have that the amplitude of both components are equal. The resulting electric field components with the cosines and sines integrated would therefore be this. And you can visualize circular polarization here, where this is right-handed polariz right polarization, and this is left-handed polarization because if you were to curl your right hand around this axis with your thumb pointing in the direction of propagation, your fingers would curl in the direction of spiraling. And here, it would be the same, but with your left hand. And so that is the convention for determining right versus left hand polarization of light. In any medium, which has a refractive index n, which is determined by the speed of light in the medium, you have a resulting, a new wave number, which depends upon n and a phase shift that also depends upon n. Specifically, we will be talking about birefringent materials. So materials like glass are isotropic, meaning the refractive index depends upon wavelength and not polarization. And that's why you don't see images being split in two when it goes through glass. But birefringent materials are anisotropic, meaning that the refractive index does depend upon polarization. So different polarizations of light will travel 
in different paths. An example here is just in this image where you can see that the quantum is being split along two different paths. And this is represented in this diagram where you have the light, which has components of horizontal and vertical polarization. The vertical polarization travels straight where the horizontal polarization travels along a different path. And so it's then split. As some notation and nomenclature, we have BPMs as beam displacing prisms being called a PAs standing for polarization analyzers. If a polarization analyzer splits a beam into horizontal and vertical polarizations, then it's denoted PA sub HV. If it splits into 45 degree angles, was positive, both positive and negative, then it's denoted PA sub 45. And you'll see that there are different things, uh, there will be different things further on that follow this general naming scheme. And if anything is ambiguous, then it will be clarified at the time it's presented. Also, the fast axis of a birefringent material is the direction associated with the lower refractive index, which just means that the speed of the wave is going to be traveling the fastest along this axis. So the slow axis is then the direction perpendicular to this, which has a higher refractive index and thereby a slower wave propagation in the medium. Linear polarizers have preferred transmission directions, which are called transmission or, or polarization axes. The, these axes are usually oriented perpendicular to the wave propagation direction, and a linear polarization or a polarizer transmits only the component of the electric field along the transmission axis. Let's let theta be the angle between the transmission axis and the propagation direction, and let u sub theta denote the transmission axis direction. Then the incident field will just be the field that's of the, of the electromagnetic wave that's arriving, and the transmitted field will be the amount of the electric field that is aligned with the transmission axis, which is represented with this dot product here. Also, wave plates are what we call optical materials that use phase shifts between perpendicular polarization components to transform the polarization of a wave. So anything that will be discussed that has or that transforms the polarization of a wave is therefore called a wave plate. And when an electromagnetic wave propagates through a birefringent material of length L, the component of polarization along the fast axis grows or garners a phase shift. And this new phase shift is called the fast phase shift. And for the slow axis, it garners a slow phase shift, which is dependent upon here the index of refraction along the slow axis and the index of refraction along the fast axis of the birefringent material. Therefore, a wave traveling through this material will garner a phase shift difference between its two components, the component along the fast axis and the component along the slow axis. So thank you for watching this. I, I know it was kind of short, but there will be a part two on this section. And after I'm done presenting part two, I will give a list of problems. And after that, my next video will be the solution to those problems. And then we can finally get into quantum mechanics where we can go over the quantum description of polarization.